Uh, scripture in this morning will be from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. <clears throat> I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, and devouring to keep the, uni the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, and just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in, in you all. Um, it is always a blessing to worship alongside you, and I am very thankful to do that this morning. Typically, this time of year, I would be at the Freed Hardeman Lectureship. I did not go this year, but that is where Paul is at, which is why you see me up here this morning. Um, I do encourage you if, you, if you would like that resource, if you go to Freed Hardeman's website, which is www.fhu.edu. At least a few times this week, Josh and I have a plan to come down here during the day and, and watch a few of those lectures. Uh, one in particular, if you just want to join us, again, this isn't something that's planned during the bulletin or anything, but I, I know that Josh and I will uh, be watching uh, a lecture at 9.30 on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday that's brought to us uh, by Brother Dan Winkler, uh, the first of which will be the providence, uh, about the providence of God. Their studies this year will be through Ezra and Nehemiah, which we're studying in Alaska Leaders, as well as our weekly devotionals, if you have been doing those, um, as well as Esther. So if you would like to join us for that, we'll be here at 9.30, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, if, if you don't want to be around us, that's fine, too. Uh, you can watch it at home on, on that website. We also have our family devotional today. We're, we're hoping to start that back on a monthly basis. That's especially for our families our, our, of with young kids, but all are encouraged to come because we are all one family, as we'll talk about this morning. Um, so I encourage you to come to that. If you would like to bring something, uh, we are in need of salad and, as Gary mentioned, desserts. Um, oh, yeah, I don't have this on, do I? Do I need to repeat everything? I don't think. <laughs> family devotional tonight, we need salad, desserts. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, drinks and and. Uh, other things uh, that you can think of. So uh, bring those today if you would like. There was a family who lived in a city and they decided they were going to move out to the country, buy some land, and have a cattle ranch. After several months uh, of, of trying this new venture, a friend came to visit them and said, so what are you going to call the ranch? And the man said, well, you know, my family all had different opinions. I wanted to call it the Bar J. My wife wanted to call it the Susie Q. My daughter wanted to call it the Flying W, and my son wanted to call it the Lazy Y. None of us could agree, so we just decided to call it the Bar J, Susie Q, Flying W, Lazy Y. And the, uh, the friend looked around and noticed a lot of empty pasture land, and he said, so where are all the cattle? And their answer said, yeah, well, um, none of them survived the branding. I was, I was wondering if I or Gary would have the worst joke this morning. I, I, I got a few more laughs. So, um, Lack of unity can have dire consequences. In this, in this joke, of course, it was for cattle. We've seen it in businesses. If there's not a unified goal, then that business is going to fail or at the very least struggle. And, of course, that's the case in the church as well. If we are not unified, then we are going to struggle with our goal of growing and sharing the gospel. This morning, we continue our look through, the, through Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. We have looked through the first half of the book, having already looked at Ephesians 1 through 3. And now we're going to begin with the first half of Ephesians chapter 4. Um, Warren Wiersbe, who wrote many commentaries in his lifetime, once noted that Paul's balance in this letter, he addresses 
doctrine, especially in the first three, ver- three chapters, and then he addresses our attitude in the last three, or what we should do in response. What is, what is our duty? Um, as Christ has purchased us to be part of his body, we must strive to be united in spirit in his body. And that is what is addressed in our passage this morning. We'll be looking at the first 16 verses of Ephesians chapter 4. This passage opens with the verse that says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, and when he says therefore, he's looking back to all the riches that were described in the first three chapters, all of the things that we have in Christ Jesus. He says, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. This is especially a call back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 which says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works in which he prepared beforehand. He says this is what we are supposed to do. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. For the remainder of this letter, Paul will bring up different aspects of, this, of what this worthy walk looks like. But in this portion of the letter, Paul specifically addresses unity. As we've already seen, this has been an issue with the church in Ephesus. It certainly was an issue in much of the early church, and it's an issue that has persisted to different degrees over the years. Different things come up that leave us disunified. And so, uh, for example, in, in 1 Corinthians, when you read, if you read that letter to the Corinthian church, they could not have been more separated from each other. As a matter of fact, if you look at chapter 5, the only thing that they are even... Um, unified in is something that is sinful. Everything else they're, they're not together on. And specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they have different spiritual gifts that they have been blessed with, and they're arguing over which gift is better than the other. And different factions come up because of that. And that, is, of course, is why we have in 1 Corinthians 13 what we often refer to as the great love chapter, which counteracts this, um, this lack of unity. Here, It is as if Paul is trying to get out in front of potential um, lack of unity. In verse 3, Paul says, be eager. Some translations might say, be diligent or endeavor to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How important is unity to you? How important is it in your personal relationships? I would think it would be very important. How important is unity in the church to you? Paul is addressing this issue because it's something that should be important to all of us. But is it something that we would say we are eager for? We are eager for unity? The Greek word that is translated as eager... um, often means hastily or zealous for something. The root word that's used there means to be swift or speedy. What are you swift about? What are you quick to do? It's typically something we're excited about, isn't it? In several days, my family will be be going on vacation. I'm excited about it, as any of us are excited about vacation, even when we enjoy what we're doing. And we start to count, we have the, you know, the countdown on the, on the fridge of how many days until we do this. It's something we're excited about. We can't wait for it to be here. If we had the ability, we would get to that point swiftly. Another example, have you ever boiled water and stepped away for just a little bit? And then you hear that terrifying sound of the water hitting the eye of the stove and sizzling. Even the slowest of us start to run a 4440 to get back into the, into the kitchen to, t- to take that water off the heat. We swiftly do that because we don't want it to make a mess. We don't want it to, to scorch on the, on the stove. So are we eager or swift about unity? This is what Paul urges Christians to have here in Ephesus. When embers of hostility begin to rise... We ought to be quick to extinguish them. When we see a brother or sister alone, whether, by, whether from hurt or maybe isolation from the body, we should be eager for them to be connected to the congregation and do what we can to, to bring them into the fold. If we're eager to maintain the unity of spirit and the bond of peace, we're intentional about overcoming disagreements. 
We're moved to go the extra mile with others, to help others out. As Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Take control of what you can take control of. Eager unity means wanting peace above all else. The success of a church's or a congregation's longevity, as well as their gospel reach, I believe depends on its members having that attitude. Sowing peace and unity rather than sowing strife and discord. Recall Jesus' prayer for his disciples in John chapter 17, verse 21, shortly before he is delivered um, to be crucified. He says his prayer is that they, talking about those who believe in him, may all be one. And he clarifies, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe you have sent me. This is unity in truth, being unified to God the Father and Jesus, being brought together by the truth. And it is how people will know who we are, as, as, as Jesus uh, describes there. And he also says earlier in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love is a large factor of unity, as we will talk about in just a minute. Are you, um, are you unified with others by truth? And are you unified with others by behavior? Because both of which are necessary. Jesus, of course, addresses there the, the importance of being unified in, in truth. But we need to also be united in demeanor. Doctrine and demeanor. And this is what I believe Paul is addressing here. Being together in like-mindedness. Think of, of your fandom in certain sports. Some of you are probably fans of the maize and blue. Others are the green and white. I remember... Uh, one time in, in high school, I grew up going to a Christian camp in northern Alabama. Now, I was an Alabama fan, still am, and I went to this camp this one summer, and there was another, there was another kid roughly my age, and he had just committed to play football at the University of Auburn. Now, he and I would, would pick at each other just a little bit, but it was, it was friendly. But there was another guy who was also an Alabama fan, who just would not stop giving it to him, just constantly making fun of him for his choice to go to the University of Auburn and telling him how Alabama had just won the national championship. Of course, little did he know that was going to be the year that Auburn won the national championship. But he continued to just give him a hard time about it to the point that it really irritated this Auburn commit. And I remember he said to me, he's like, I just wish you would just let up because it was driving him crazy. Now, I did not do that. We played, we played around a little bit, but I didn't continue to, to, to harp on him. Me and this other Alabama fan, we may have been united in our belief about who the best team was, but we were not united in our behavior. We need to be on the same page when it comes to our belief and our trust in what the Word of God says. Because not all unity is God approved. We need to remember that as well. Unity should not be unity at the cost of truth. But we should be unified in our behavior and our attitude towards one another and towards those that we might reach with the gospel as well as towards God's Word. Think about your brothers and sisters that you grew up with, if you have siblings. Were there ever times that you disagreed? I'm sure there were. But you know what? At the end of the day, you had to share a roof with that individual. And so that meant you had to overcome certain things that otherwise maybe you wouldn't have wanted to overcome. When we are a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, there may be disagreements that we have. There may be times that we frustrate each other. But if it's something that we can, as far as depends on us, be peaceful with one another, then we need to strive for that because we share the same roof in the household of God. Here's what walking in unity looks like, what that demeanor of, of unity looks like. He mentions briefly in verse 
two, four different things. One, he says, walk with all humility. That is, counting others more significant than yourself, as we re read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, walk with gentleness. That's how we, how we interact with others, how we speak to others, especially in difficult circumstances. For example, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 says, the soft word turns away wrath. Paul writes in another letter in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, if someone is, is sick with sin, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness certainly goes a long way in keeping unity, even in difficult situations. He says, walk with patience. Patience certainly helps us in our unconditional relationships, doesn't it? Parents, patience allows you to love your kids even on the days that they're driving you up the wall. Wives, it allows you to be patient with your husband when he puts the silverware in the sink rather than the dishwasher. Husbands, it allows you to, to be loving and patient towards your wives when somehow, no matter what, there's always hair in the shower. We are to be patient with each other no matter what our disagreements are. James chapter 5, verse 8 says, You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We all have the same calling and the same hope. And to walk by bearing with one another in love. Love goes a long way for unity. As, he wrote to the, as Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, love bears all things. It endures all things. It believes all things. It, it hopes all things. And just to add to that, love never fails. To walk in a way worthy of the calling to which we have, it is to walk in love, bearing with each other in spite of our differences. And certainly the church in Ephesus had their differences, being both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. These these attitudes combined allows us to be more merciful and gracious and forgiving. It causes us to be more apologetic and to take responsibility where we can. It encourages us to be more peaceful with each other because of our patience and gentleness and love and humility towards one another. We need to realize that spiritual unity is not something that is common. We cannot treat it that way. Look to the next three verses. When we read this, uh, these verses, verses 4 through 6, we often look at this simply as a passage to combat denominationalism. And certainly, this does fly in the face of denominationalism. But I do believe that God's main purpose for this passage, speaking, to, uh, speaking through Paul to the church in Ephesus and now to us, was to remind them of all the things that they share. To remind a body that is... At has at times been quite fractured to be reminded of what they are united in. Recall in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 and following, the Gentiles were called those who were once were far off from the promise. But because of Jesus, who preached peace to those who are far off and to those who are near, that is, Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, they are all no longer strangers and aliens to each other, but they are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now look at the singular language of the next few verses. Again, this is in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, picking up in verse 19. You are built on the foundation, that is a singular foundation, members of the household, singular, of God. Verse 20, built on the foundation, that is, again, a singular foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the singular cornerstone. Verse 21, in whom the whole structure, which again, singular, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is, again, a singular temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a singular dwelling place for God by the Spirit. How great it is that God's redemption led to your salvation, to my salvation, to the salvation of those who follow God, who went before, and those who, who put Him on, who come after us. This unity is something that we can achieve in Jesus, and it is a unity that is not common because it is not offered 
to anyone else except for those who are united in Christ Jesus. Let's look at the different ways that we are one. First of all, we are one body. There can only be, there is only one body. Again, reminded of, uh, I'm reminded of the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. They're told, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. There should be no separation, no denomination. We are one body, one church of Jesus Christ. Both Jews and Greek, slave and free, all were made to drink of the one spirit. Because of Jesus, we are many members of one body under the head that is Jesus Christ. Secondly, we are united in one spirit. This is the spirit that dwells in all Christians to strengthen and, and guide us. That's what the spirit does for us that we read in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. This is the same spirit that we read about in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. That is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire full possession of it. This is what we share. Third, we share just one hope. We may have different desires and different hopes in our, in our lives, but there is one hope of our calling. This is what we're looking forward to, the coming of our Lord, which will bring us, which will lead us to eternal life in Him. This is guaranteed to all who believe. It makes hope, which is often looked at as a verb, something that we hope we hope about something, it turns that verb into a noun. It is something that we cling to, the hope that we have in Jesus. We have one Lord, one Master. In Acts chapter 10, as Paul is preaching the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time, uh, excuse me, Peter is preaching to the Gentiles for the first time, it says, As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, saying he is Lord of all, Verse 43 says, To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. He is one Lord who offers one way of salvation. As we all have one master, we have only one that we must follow, and we follow his one word. And through that word is where we find our one faith. Notice that these last few are, are mentioned in, in very rapid succession, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. They are all connected. Faith is connected to our God and our obedience to Him. Faith and baptism are, are directly connected as we read in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that connects us to our next part. One baptism much could be said and much has been said about exactly what this one baptism is. But the one baptism that Paul is talking about here could be nothing else than the baptism commanded by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, when he says, make disciples, baptizing them. All nations make disciples, baptizing them. It is no longer those who are circumcised who are God's people, which is the dilemma in Ephesians chapter 2 but all those who believe and follow what he says. In Acts chapter 19, for example, Paul addresses the Christians in Ephesus, and he asks if they received the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they say, well, we were baptized. Uh, he asks if they did that when they were baptized, and he said, well, we were baptized with, with repentance that, that John offered us. And in verse, uh, in verse 4, Paul says, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who has, was to come after him. That is Jesus. And what we read next in verse 5 is that all of them were baptized into Jesus Christ. This is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit that many suggest that we read about at the beginning of Acts chapter 2 when the apostles are, are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's not what we read about in Acts chapter 10 when the Gentiles are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Those are the only two times that we see that. The one baptism that we are all connected in is what's mentioned later on in Acts chapter 10 when they have the Holy Spirit and says, what prevents them from being baptized? We are all baptized into one baptism, into his one body, the church. 
And there is one God and Father of all. Paul has been preaching through the, uh, through the ten plagues. This is Paul Holland. has been preaching through the ten plagues over the last several weeks um, and has contrasted uh, Jehovah God with the many gods of Egypt. Can you imagine having to turn to so many different deities when things are going on, wondering which one you upset, which one you need to sacrifice to? But we have one God, one Master, one Lord, one King. The God of the Jews is likewise the God of the Gentiles. He is the God of you, the God of me. He's the Father who made us and has allowed us to be adopted sons and daughters, fellow heirs, according to Christ Jesus. It is truly a blessing to be one in so many ways. Maybe you look around this morning and you see your neighbor as some that you don't really know that well. Maybe they're a different generation, or maybe you just ha never had an opportunity to speak with them. I spoke with someone this morning because I usually sit over there, and they sit over here, and they say, yeah, we, we have our different subdivisions, don't we? Because sometimes it's hard to get from here to there. But you look at them and you think, maybe I I'm not really sure how what we have in common. Well, you might have more in common than you think. But even before finding out the things that you have in common, here's one thing that we all share if we are in Christ Jesus. We have the opportunity to be one. Even before getting to know them, the reminders of this text show us just how much we have in common by being one in God. And by being one body, God has also blessed us as individual members of it. And that's what the, the remainder of this passage talks about from verse 7 through verse 16. Verse 7 says, Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And the, the following passage references Psalm 68, verse 18, which refers to His ascending on high, and it talks about how Jesus descends to the earthly realm from heaven and then ascends back to heaven. And in the process, Christ equipped us with what we need to grow in wisdom, which is referenced, of course, in Ephesians chapter 1. He's equipped us with His power to be His hands as we work on the earth for Him. That's what is meant in verse 10 when He says, He ascended far above the heavens that He might also fill all things. Christ has filled the world with His power and His goodness, and He, this Power and goodness is displayed in the work of his body, the work of you and of me. Jesus, what we can gain uh, encouragement from here is that though Jesus ascended to heaven, he did not leave us empty-handed. He's given us all skills and, and abilities to, to further glorify his name. These skills are, are different, just as our roles are different, but they are all important and critical. Some mentioned in this passage were specific to the first century, some of these abilities, that is being uh, apostles and prophets, while others con uh, continue even today, teachers, shepherds, evangelists. But regardless of our role or our ability, God wants us to be unified and to use our skills and our roles to grow together, to grow individually, and to share the gospel with others. It is to be, as we read in verses 12 through 14, to be built up in the body of Christ because we are equipped for maturity. To, build up, to be built up in the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Verses 12 through 14. This contrast of, of walking in immaturity and, and mature manhood reminds me of, of going to the ocean. A child that walks out into the ocean, even some small waves can knock them over. But if, they're, if their mature father picks them up, even some strong waves can hit them and not knock them over. This is what maturity looks like in its physical form. And it's what it looks like in its spiritual form as well. We are to build each other up so that we can be mature, not tossed to and fro by the waves of every doctrine that comes our way. Notice too, though, that this is not just one person. 
evangelists and teachers and shepherds, they have their jobs to do, but their job is not to do the job of everyone else, but rather to further equip everyone so that we can all serve and we can all work. Unity comes from spiritual maturity, and unity, unity of the body comes from individual members growing together and working together and sharing the mindset of unity. In verses uh, 2 and 3, um, it, it, we, we read about this. It comes from acknowledging uh, the attitudes that we should have, humility and, and the others that were mentioned. Romans 12, verses 3 through 5 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, of course, that's humility, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members don't all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of it. We're all to work for the body, but we're all supposed to individually work with what we have been equipped with. Paul concludes this thought in verses 15 through 17 of Ephesians chapter 4 when he says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in every way into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, you want to underline or circle that? Every joint with which it is equipped, when, and circle this as well, each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Each part, every joint. This means we all must be working with what we have been given. For Father's Day this last year, Michelle and the kids got me this electric smoker. I've never... I've never done any, any smoking of, of, of meat, and so this is the first time I got to do that and really feel like a man. And so for months, it sat in my garage unused until about a month ago I finally used it. And all I could think was so much time was wasted. Joking aside, just having the equipment is, is worthless if we aren't using what we have been equipped with. We have to use the abilities that God has given us. We all have different ones. We all have different roles with those, with those abilities. But if we aren't using what God has given us and we are neglecting it, then we aren't growing and the church is not growing to its full potential and we are not reaching those with the gospel as much as we could reach them. This passage is pretty clear. Every joint and every part must be working, and they must be working together. When we're working, we'll see more unity, we'll see more growth, and we'll see more accomplished for the sake of the gospel. If any of you are builders or creators, it's nice when, when you see the thing that you have put together working to its full potential. When we are God's workmanship. Imagine how much joy it brings God to look down and see the thing that he has created through his son's sacrifice, the church, functioning properly. And imagine, too, the sadness when we aren't doing what God has created us to do, to grow together and to share the gospel with others, to serve those in the kingdom. So this morning... I want you to think about this question. How am I equipped to serve his kingdom? Maybe you know that answer already. You've, you've figured that out. Maybe you're using your skills to glorify God and, and to serve his church. But also look to others, not in a judgmental way, but looking to others and ask, how are they equipped to serve his kingdom? And maybe you don't know these other individuals that, that you're looking to when you're asking that question. Learn more about them. Build relationships with them so that you can work together towards the common goal of growth in the church and the sharing of the gospel. Maybe they are equipped with something that you're not equipped with. Help find a way to, to use them to the glory of God. Family, it's a blessing to be one in Christ Jesus. As reminded in this passage, let us walk in eagerness to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Let us remember that we are one body united 
by our one Lord in one spirit with one hope of one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. And as his body, we are all, remember that we are all equipped to serve him in different ways. I urge you to find out that way if you are not working properly. Every joint and every part must be working and working together. This morning I ask, are you a part of the body? Have you been baptized into Christ Jesus and into his church? Because you can be. Jesus has provided that way by believing in him, repenting and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. To put him on in baptism and to live as fully equipped and working members of the body of Christ. Maybe this morning you are, you're thinking about it. You're thinking about the things that we've studied this morning and says, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the body, but I haven't been working as I should. And honestly, I'm not really sure how God wants to use me. That's an opportunity for prayer as well. To pray for yourself and also if you want to come forward this morning and, and ask for prayers of strength, from your brothers and sisters to try to figure out how does God want to use me? We'd love to find out that answer together through prayer and through communication. Maybe you're guilty of sin. or Maybe, there is, maybe there's an argument that you've had with somebody else and it has created a wedge between you Don't let Satan create a wedge between you and in the middle of the church. If it's something that you can take responsibility for, do so. Seek forgiveness. Be unified once again. I encourage you, whatever it is that you need, whatever is necessary to keep unity today, do that. Please come now as together we stand and sing.